All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Nevin Iyengar. Like I said, I'm a product designer at Netflix, where I've worked for many different, uh, many years, and different parts of the uh, the Netflix product. And so when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about everything you use to sign up for Netflix, or once you're a member, sign into Netflix, pick something to watch, watch it, binge watch onto the next thing. All those things are uh, you know pieces that the team that I work on designs and develops. And just by show of hands, who here actually uses Netflix? Okay. All right, so a lot of you. So then you know Netflix is fun and entertaining and relaxing for you, but you might be surprised to know how scientific and rigorous and serious we are in our approach to the design and the development of the product. And so I'm going to go a little deeper on that today, talk about how we think about experimentation, which really means A-B testing. Um, and then I'll go into how that's really affected the way we actually design and think about the product. But first... Uh, this is not working, so I just... I'll keep talking while you go. But first, <laughs> I'm going to start with this guy. Uh, this is Galileo, Galilei, who, as you all know, he was a scientist, right? 16th century in Italy. Now, during Galileo's time, science hadn't changed in 2,000 years. In fact, science was really philosophy. The, the ancient Greek philosophers had looked around at the world, made observations, and said, this is how the world works. And nobody really questioned their ideas all through the Middle Ages, all up until Galileo's time. Now, one of the things that the ancient Greek philosophers had said was that the heavier something is, the faster it falls through the air. Now, on the surface, that seems intuitive, right? If you see an apple fall off a tree, it goes fast. If you see a leaf fall off the tree, it sort of floats down slowly. Sure, that seems intuitive. Now, Galileo had a theory that that wasn't true. But in order to prove it, he designed an experiment. It was one of the first experiments, uh, and one of the most famous experiments of all time. So what he did was, OK, I'm just going to use the, <laughs> the keyboard here. What he did was that he, um, he went to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and he took two stones with him. They were both the same size, but they were different weights. Okay, So they were made out of different materials. And what he did was that he dropped them off the Leaning Tower. And what do you suppose happened? Well, they hit the ground at the same time. Not what you'd expect to happen, right, if heavier objects fall faster than light objects. And so Galileo had disproven in one moment what had been considered a scientific fact for 2,000 years. That's really the power of an experiment. Now, as to why a feather falls slower than a stone, Galileo couldn't really prove that. If you look in his notebooks at the time, he said, you know, it probably has something to do with the shape of the feather or the air pushing up on the feather. But there was no experiment he could run where he could remove all the air from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, right? Now, what's cool is that as technology improves, you can run more sophisticated experiments. So recently, on this BBC Two show, they ran the true experiment in, in very dramatic fashion. They got a huge rock and a huge feather, and they got a huge vacuum chamber where they pulled out all the air, and they, they ran the true experiment. And what do you suppose happened? Spoiler alert. They are going to hit the ground at the same time. And so we really appreciate this idea at Netflix that instead of listening to conventional wisdom or what people tell you is the truth, you go, you go into the real world, you collect behavioral data and understand, get to your own conclusions, and the only difference is that instead of looking at the world of physical objects and motion, we're looking at the world of our customers' behavior and customer satisfaction and trying to learn more about how that works. And how do we do that? Well, we run experiments too. And we've found that this idea of thinking of our work as if it were a series of experiments really frees up our thinking. It allows us to try more innovative ideas and crazy ideas and maybe even stupid ideas, but in a small-scale contained way first to really understand what the effects are of what we're doing before we invest in building that at scale for 125 million Netflix customers. Because we're trying to solve for something that you may be too, at whatever app or website you're working on, which is that we, ha we have way more ideas than we could ever actually design and build and ship. And so what experimentation allows us to do is try just a little bit of a lot of ideas to see where we should invest further. Now, at the core of every experiment is this idea of the scientific method. You may remember from high school, I know it sounds fancy, but really all the scientific method is, it's a systematic way 
to learn information about how the world works. And not just any information, but reliable information. Information that you can use to predict the future behavior of the world. And so, we use the same scientific method, the simplified version at least, for our experiments too. So we're starting with a hypothesis. A hypothesis is just a statement of how you think the world works, stated in a way that you can prove it true or false. And then you're running some experiment. This is you gathering data from real-world behavior in as unbiased a way as possible. And then there's some analysis or result phase where you're taking what you observed and what your hypothesis was and trying to decide whether your hypothesis is true or false. Now, it's worth noting that both of those outcomes, true or false, are actually pretty positive. Because if you, especially in a product development context, if you disprove your hypothesis, then you have just saved yourself a lot of time. You might have designed and built and shipped something that actually doesn't have a meaningful impact on your customer's satisfaction. And if you prove your hypothesis true, also great, because you've just opened up a fruitful new area of exploration that can improve your customer's experience. And so really, when I'm talking about experimentation, I'm talking about A-B testing. A-B testing is the only way to truly run an experiment in a product development and design context and be able to say with a high level of confidence that the changes you're making are improving a customer's experience. So when we run an A-B test, we, we have a 95% level of confidence that what we're doing is the right thing for the customers. That still means that one out of 20 times we might be wrong, but it's the highest you can really get. And so let me talk a little bit more deeply about how we A-B test in Netflix, because it's a little more sophisticated than Galileo's experiment. Uh, we're running controlled experiments, which means there's something that can, called the control experience, which is our systems in production as they are today, no change, because we want to compare that against whatever we're going to do uh, to improve it. And as I mentioned, we're always starting with a hypothesis. This is just an example, but on Netflix, we might say that personalizing the content displayed on the home page will um, causing more, more people to retain their Netflix subscription. So Netflix is a subscription business. People choose to pay us month to month. And what's great about that is that that is a very highly correlated with what we think of as customer satisfaction. If you're satisfied with Netflix, you continue to pay us. And it's also good for us because it sustains our business and helps us make more content and make the product better. And so once we have that hypothesis, we're creating a series of variations. Now these are different interpretations of what the hypothesis is. If you think about what personalization means on a given page, that could be the algorithm that drives it, that could be how it's visually presented, all sorts of things and ways to get back at personalization. And so what we're doing is actually thinking very broadly about all the different things that we could do. And there's a lot of art and judgment that goes into what we think we actually, what, what has the most potential and what we actually want to design and build. And now this is us running our tests. So we are randomly putting different people as I sign up to, for Netflix into different experiences. This could be millions of people per experience and, and letting them uh, try out that version of the hypothesis. And so what's important to note here is that when they open their app and they're in that experience, they don't know about all the other experiences. So they act in a really unbiased way. And the other thing about A-B testing that I think sometimes people criticize is that they think it takes all the creativity out of design, and that's not true at all in my experience. What happens is that once you are allowed to do all these different variations, you can try really creative ideas that are very different than each other. This is not about little button colors or pixel level changes. And then at the end of some period of time, we're determining a winner of our test, and that's really going back to these metrics, like I said, from uh, customer satisfaction. The more satisfied people stayed with Netflix longer and they were in this experience. So once we have that winner, that's rolled out to everyone. That's the new default experience of Netflix, and that's the new control experience for future tests we want to run. So in that way, we're constantly iterating and changing and building and moving the Netflix product forward, but only in directions that make sense because they improve the customer experience. And so if I could just encapsulate that idea and what I've learned from it, is that we think of product development as a series of experiments. And I'd propose that that leads to stronger designs, whether you can test or not. Now, I know not everyone in this room has access to A-B testing. You need a lot of engineering infrastructure. You need a lot of customers to do that. Um, but what I would propose is that even just thinking about your design process in this more methodical way can lead to stronger designs. Now, so far, I've been talking about a hypothesis like that's an easy thing to get to. Um, but in reality, you may have more hypotheses than you know what to do with and you don't know where to start, or you may be too overwhelmed and have no hypothesis at all. And so there are a lot of different tools we have in our tool belt that we combine with A-B testing to develop a hypothesis. So for example, we're running 
um, ethnography studies. This means we're going into people's homes, maybe only talking to two to three people a day. We're going to different countries like India or Thailand, but we're really living with people in their environment, trying to understand how they live their lives, what some of their unmet needs are. And, you know, of course, we're only talking to two or three people, so that's not representative of how everybody feels, but it helps us get an idea of some of the nuances behind things. And then, of course, we're running focus groups and usability studies. This is where we're bringing people into an artificial environment, and it might be more people, five to ten people a day. We could ask them questions, understand why they do some of the things they do, um, or at least what they say they do. We can put prototypes in front of them and observe how they use them and ask them what they think of the experience. But again, this is not representative of what everybody thinks. It's just the five or ten people we brought in that day. Then we can run surveys. This is even more people. This might be thousands or tens of thousands of people that we can ask questions to them online, right? And we're asking their opinion. So, of course, there's some bias in that. But what we do know is that the more people we ask, the more representative they are of what the larger population thinks. At the end of the day, though, it's still someone's opinion. Then, of course, we also have data. We have trends in our own data that we can see and use. This is a more quantitative method, but it doesn't tell us what hypothesis we should test. Really, all it tells us is how people currently use Netflix. So in this case, I could say with 100% certainty that more people watch Netflix on TVs than phones, for example. But that doesn't really tell me what I should do. What is my hypothesis for how you're going to improve the customer experience now that you know that? And so if I would, could draw a line between all the things I just talked about, which are ways to really develop, generate and develop that hypothesis, really A-B testing is the only way to run an experiment and validate one of those hypotheses. And so we've probably run tens of thousands of tests during my time at Netflix, and the most interesting ones are always the ones that reveal these non-intuitive things about human behavior. And the, the top line of that is really that what we've learned is that you need to observe what people do, not what they say. And that's what A-B testing in its unbiased way of observing people really allows us to do. This, there's this quirk of human behavior that people say things, but that doesn't really correlate very well with what they will actually do uh, in real life. And so as an example, um, here's a survey that we've run with uh, potential customers of Netflix many times. Uh, we've asked them, what one thing would you like to know more about before you sign up for Netflix? Any guesses on what this big red sector is? Feel free to shout it out. I think I heard it somewhere. It was uh, content. People want to know, what is the content you have on Netflix? You might be surprised to know that when you go to sign up for Netflix today, or at least uh, in the past, you weren't able to find out what our catalog was. We actually made you sign up for the free trial, and then once you're in there, you could pick whatever you want to watch and watch it over those 30 days for free. And so this idea that that's strange has definitely been percolating up within Netflix. Every time a new designer joins the Netflix design team, they say, hey, why don't we do this? And so we have this hypothesis, right? The hypothesis is that by showing people what our catalog is before they sign up for Netflix, it'll actually make them more likely to sign up. So that's the hypothesis that we needed to test. Now, we could have just gone straight to A-B testing there, but we wanted to understand, again, like I said, develop that hypothesis, understand some of the nuances behind it to make our designs even that much more likely to win in an A-B test. And so we did some qualitative uh, research. This was our uh, non-member homepage at the time, which, pretty simple, pretty focused, had a start your free month button, some supporting points, and then we built a series of prototypes. I'm just going to show you one for purposes of the narrative here. Um, where we allowed people to scroll down from there and see all the titles that we had available. You could navigate over to any different genre. You could see what horror movies we had on Netflix. All the while, you couldn't actually play anything. If you try to play something, um, you still have to sign up for the free trial. That's just how our, our licensing model works. So now when we took this into qualitative studies, people said, yes, this is exactly what I need to decide whether to sign up for Netflix. And so we thought we had a hit on our hands. But when we actually observed them in these qualitative studies, standing behind the glass and seeing how they used the prototypes, we realized that they were getting a bit bogged down. They, they were getting into what we call internally shopping mode. So they were looking for a specific piece of content or title that said to them, yeah, I want to watch this, so I should sign up for Netflix. And so we were starting to believe that this might not be actually the best non-member uh, customer experience. But the only way to go from believing that to knowing that was to run an experiment, to run an A-B test. And so we did that. Actually, we ran five A-B tests. Each time, we had the control experience, which was our, uh, our normal page without access to the content. And we had variations. We allowed people to go explore our content in different ways. And every time, 
the winner was actually the control experience, the experience without any content in it. Very not intuitive, right? But what the learning here that we found was that that's not actually, you know, just a page of content is not an indicator of whether you should join Netflix or not. When people join Netflix for a free trial, there's all these other things that we can't communicate on that page, like the fact that you can pick from all these different titles and they start immediately, you can start watching on one device and pick up on another, the high quality of the streaming, all of those things are not able to be communicated just on a page where you can see what titles are on Netflix. And so it was a really good learning for us. Of course, we wanted to listen to our customers. Our customers are still uh, asking us for something, which is that they want to know what the content is and have a better idea before they sign up for Netflix. And so through subsequent rounds of testing, this is actually our home page today, and I'm sure it may change in the future as we continue testing. But what we have here is a non-interactive wall of content that shows up in the background here. And what this is, it's personalized, it's uh, tailored to what region you're in, what content's available, so it gives people an idea of what's popular in the region, likely something they, is, they recognize in here, and lets them know that, hey, you're gonna get to watch all these things when you sign up. But it doesn't let them get bogged down in trying to find the, every specific thing that's in our catalog. And so I challenge you to think about the same thing. What behavior can you observe? If you, have, if you can A-B test, sure, do that because that is the most unbiased way to observe people. But even what we saw in our qualitative sessions is that when we ask someone whether it's the right experience, they may say one thing, but if you actually observe how they use it and try to be as objective as you can, you'll see that there might actually be a discrepancy between those two things. So if I could just encapsulate that approach again, is that we think of product development as a series of experiments, and I propose that that leads to stronger designs, whether you can test or not, because you can just approach your design in a more methodical way. That's my time. Thanks very much.